All right, so forgive the blinding light over my shoulder. That's just my window. Um, today, what we're going to discuss is the first case of the year. And this is one of my favorite cases because it involves people eating each other. That, I, I don't know if you're into it, I think that's amazing because we're going to talk about cannibalism in our first case. But <clears throat> the real reason we actually study this case is because I'm going to show you how to properly do a case brief, which is something that they do in law school all the time. And I told you this class is going to be run a lot like a law school class. And it's also going to be our first delve into criminal law. It's the subject that you guys, you know, most of my students find the most fun to study because it deals with, you know, crimes. We talk about murder. We talk about arson. We talk about all sorts of things. So, sorry, I'm very popular. So that's um, the first thing that we're going to do. So this case is called Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. Yes, it's a funny word, but Regina, it's important to know what it means. And if you were in my first day class, you know what it means. It's Latin for the queen. So this is the queen versus Dudley and Stevens. So right away, the first thing that should pop out in your mind is if there's a queen involved, this is not a case from the United States. It's not. It's dealing with four sailors who are from Britain, Great Britain, the United Kingdom. So this is the queen versus two of these sailors. And you may ask, why are we studying a case that is not from the United States? The reason is, as a whole, as the country, we base our legal system off of common law. And we'll discuss what that is later on in the class in you know, a couple of weeks when we start you know, fleshing this out a little bit more. But our legal system is pretty much based on what they have in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom. So this case set a precedent that a lot of courts in the United States, the United States legal system, would eventually follow. So... Yes, it actually holds no power. The ruling in this case holds no power and no sway over anything in the United States. But it did set a precedent for answering the question, is necessity ever a justification for murder? And what I mean by that is, can you ever say, I had to kill him. There was no other way. He had to die. It was necessary that I had to kill this person. So that's what we're going to discuss. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read from this sheet. This is the case Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. And if you're in class, you're actually going to get a copy of this that we're going to cover and read tomorrow, which would be Monday as I film this lesson. Um, and if not, you're just going to listen to my lecture and we're going to go along. And then I'm going to show you some resources online that you can use to find all of the facts and everything you're going to need to do your first case brief on this case. So if you look at my screen... Right here, I'm giving you some background to this case. Um, you see four men in a lifeboat, and one of them looks kind of sick. Uh, he gonna die. Okay, he's not just gonna die; he's gonna be murdered and eaten by these three here. Okay, so if the case is called the Queen versus Dudley and Stevens, two of these guys, one's got to be Dudley, one's got to be Stevens. All right. The reason why the other guy will talk why he wasn't in this case, and then, of course, um, Parker here, you'll learn his name in a minute, he gets jugged in the throat and dies and gets eaten. So <clears throat> let's discuss this. I'm going to read this to you. Again, in class, we read it together. All right, but let me mute my phone. Some people are always, you know, they're, I'm, I'm, I, am, I am a popular person. People want to talk to me. So I have to put them on hold while I teach my lessons to you guys because you – you come first, all right? So, <clears throat> Regina versus Dudley and Stevens, the famous story of a shipwrecked boat, two starving castaways, and their act of cannibalism is one of the most important criminal cases in the common law world. And we are part of the common law world. Louisiana runs on a civil law system, but you may hear that if anyone in your family is an attorney or a lawyer or studied the law. But for right now, just understand as a whole, the United States runs on what's called a common law system. And I'll flesh that out and make that make sense for you a little bit later on. Pretty much all that means is that when one court makes a decision, that's called a precedent. It sets a precedent. And other courts are then bound, courts that are lower than that court, <clears throat> are usually bound by that decision. So what it's saying here is the decision that this court made in this case of cannibalism pretty much set the tone for how acts like this will be looked at 
for the rest of, of time by, by the legal system, by the common law legal system of which we are a part. All right. <clears throat> it set the tone on the troubled issue of whether the defense of necessity should be available in circumstances where life was taken in order to preserve another person's life. All right. The significance of Regina versus Dudley and Stevens lies in the fact that that the English courts, for the first time, decisively and absolutely laid down the common law concerning this issue and upheld the principle that human life is to be protected at all costs, that life shall not be taken or sacrificed even to preserve one's own life, and that the defense of necessity is no excuse. So in this case, before we even get into the facts, what happened, I'm telling you the outcome. I'm giving you like a freebie here that the English court said that it is never okay to sacrifice someone else's life in order to preserve the life of others. Now, this is where it's going to get a little tricky. They're going to play a word game here. If you switch that, they're going to say that's okay. We'll get that in a little bit. I know this might be confusing, but follow along, follow along. For right now, all you have to know is that human life is to be protected at all costs, that life shall not be taken or sacrificed even to preserve one's own life, and that the defense of necessity is no excuse. You cannot have said he needed to die in order to save me. Okay? <clears throat> all right. So here are the facts. On May 5th, 1884, so it is a long time ago. We're talking like sailing ships, you know, when you think of like wooden ships and sailors and then singing uh, sea shanties and all that stuff. That's what this is all about. All right. The English yacht Mignonette started its voyage to Sydney, Australia from England. There was a crew of four on board. So this is a sailing ship. All right. I believe as the story goes that the owner of the ship paid these four men to sail the ship from England to Sydney, Australia. That's a long trip. Look at a map. If you're not in geography, stop what you're doing. Look at a map. That is a long way to sail. You got to go all the way down. And then you got to go around Africa, which um, is apparently very treacherous waters to sail. So there's a long way to go. All right. So there's four crew on board. Tom Dudley, the captain. There's Dudley. Edward Stevens, the mate. There's your Stevens. Edmund Brooks, a crewman, and Richard Parker, the ship's boy. Right? The ship's boy is kind of like the gopher. Hey, go get that. Go do this. All right? That was his job. He was young. The voyage was uneventful until the 5th of July when, having deviated from the main trade route in search of fair weather, 1,600 miles off the Cape of Good Hope, the yacht was hit by a massive wave and sank within minutes, forcing the crew to put to sea in their lifeboat, a 13-foot open dinghy. Okay, besides the fact that the word dinghy is hilarious, let's discuss what happened. So back in the day, and all when we talk about facts of a case, some facts are a lot more important than others. Now, I want you to think about this. There were what were called trade routes. These were the ways that ships would sail, kind of like a road. And all ships knew this was the way to get from point A to point B. The captain, Dudley, decided to deviate from the trade route. He went a different way. Is that an important fact to know for this case? Yes, it is really important. Here's why. If they would have wrecked on the trade route, they would have known that it wouldn't have taken very long for another ship to have found them, right? However, they knew they were off the beaten path. They were off the normal course. So now they're shipwrecked. The ship sank very fast, and they're in this 13-foot, that's tiny, open dinghy. As you see in the picture here, this is an open dinghy. There's no covering. They're exposed to the elements. There's four of them. Now they know they weren't on the trade route, so what are the odds that a ship is going to find them? <clears throat> Probably not very good unless they hope another ship deviated from the trade routes, which why would you do that? I believe in this story, it doesn't say, and I haven't been able to find for any of the facts, that he was trying to save time, make up time. Um, avoid weather, whatever the case may be, it would be like if I broke down on I-12, right, right over there, I know someone's going to find me. But if I got off of I-12, went through some back roads and found some like dirt path through Livingston Parish and break down there, I might be a little more concerned that no one's going to find me where I'm at. So remember that that is an important fact, okay? For the first 10 days, 
The crew survived on two tins of turnips, uh, whatever rainwater they succeeded in collecting, and the innards and skin of a turtle hauled on board on the fourth day. So they have turnips, they have rainwater, and they caught themselves a derpy turtle. Okay, because I've never seen a turtle just swim up to a boat and be like, hey, they hit it with an oar and they kept it and they ate it. All right, but so on the fourth day, they got themselves a turtle. The boat was drifting on the ocean, probably more than a thousand miles away from land. So two important facts. They know that they're not going to be found right away because they deviated from the trade route. And they know they're more than a thousand miles away from land, meaning they're probably not just going to, you know, like, like wake up tomorrow and they're at a beach. All right. So and they have no food, turnips, a turtle and rainwater. Do you think these men are desperate? I think they're pretty freaked out. I think they don't see a lot of hope for the fact that they're going to be safe. All right. <clears throat> so let's keep going with the facts. Now, on the 18th day, after seven days without food and water, you guys can't make it till fifth hour without complaining about eating. They are seven days now without food and water. They've been at sea in this open dinghy for 18 days. They're getting pretty desperate, all right? Dudley proposed that lots should be drawn so that one of them could be sacrificed to feed the others. I like to think that I'm the type of person who no matter how much or how hungry I get, I don't look at you and say, that looks delicious. But these guys were in a rough spot. And when they said draw lots, what he means is like draw straws. That's what draw lots means if you think about that. So put four straws in a cup. One of them is shorter than the other. Whoever draws the short straw, that person is going to be sacrificed to feed the others. Okay? So that was Captain Dudley's proposition. Brooks, remember, he's the guy not mentioned in the case. Brooks rejected the proposal. And Richard Parker, that's the ship's boy. I believe he was like 16. I know it's in here somewhere. I can't remember offhand. To whom they were understood to refer was not consulted. So only the three adults, the captain, the mate, and the sailor, say, let's draw lots. But we're not going to tell poor Parker about it. No, we're not going to ask him whether or not he wants to be involved in this. He's going to be involved, but we're not going to ask him. But Brooks said, no, he wants nothing to do with it. All right, Stevens, although skeptical at first, was eventually persuaded that their only hope of survival lay in killing and eating the boy, who was then drifting in and out of consciousness and by far the weakest of the four. So Dudley convinces Stevens, hey, Parker's going to die. He's – look, I mean look at this picture. He, that's Parker. He's, he's passing in and out. He doesn't even know what day of the week it is. This man this, – this boy can hear color. OK, he's going to die. Let's just pick him. He's you know, we need to we have to survive. And in fact, they argue that Parker is only technically a potential life. He's 16 years old. Dudley is a ship's captain. Look at all the knowledge and skill that it takes to be a ship's captain. Why would he sacrifice himself? Right. He's done his time. He is a very knowledgeable, skilled sailor, skilled captain. He is more valuable alive. Same thing with Stevens, the ship's mate. All these men argued that as adults with, with already established lives and careers and skills, that they were more valuable alive than Richard Parker, who was only a, a cabin boy, who hadn't yet gained anything worth of value or skill or, or anything like that. So he should die. All right. So on the day of the act in question, meaning the day they were going to kill poor Richard Parker, Dudley and Stevens spoke of their having families and suggested it would be better to kill the boy in order to save their lives. And Dudley proposed that if there was no vessel, meaning no other ship in sight by the following morning, the boy should be killed. So see what they're saying too? They're saying we also have families. We have wives and children at home. Parker has nobody. He needs to die. We have established lives. He's only a young boy. He's a potential life. We're more valuable than him. All right, so the next day, no vessel appearing, Dudley suggested to Stevens and Brooks the boy had better, had better be killed. Stevens agreed to the act. Brooks dissented. So Dudley and Stevens say kill the boy. Brooks says, no, I'm not going to do it. Okay? The boy was lying at the bottom of the boat, helpless and extremely weakened by famine and drinking seawater 
unable to make any resistance. Y'all, if you drink seawater, you actually dehydrate yourself because your body has to use water in your body to get the salt out of the seawater. So drinking seawater, drinking of it will kill you. So Parker is delirious. He's losing his mind. He's drifting in and out of consciousness. He is, he's in a state, all right? Dudley approached the boy with the words, this is what he tells him, Richard, your hour has come. It's kind of dramatic. And receiving a faint reply, Parker said, what, me, sir? And Dudley said, yes, my boy, and stabbed him in the neck with a pen knife. Okay? So what this tells you is Dudley, the captain, went up to the boy, said, Richard, your time has come. He, Richard Parker was drifting in and out of consciousness, but he was aware enough to respond and say, what, me? Did he want to die? No, of course not. He wasn't passed out. He was aware of what was happening. So being aware that he was about to be murdered, the captain then jugged him in the throat with a pen knife. All right. So for the next four days, all three men, including Brooks, Brooks didn't want to be involved. But at this point, he was so hungry and so out of his mind that all three men fed on the boy's body and drank his blood. I know that's gross, but this is an important fact of the case. On the fourth day after the act was committed, the three men were sighted by a German ship and picked up by it in the lowest state of prostration. What they were prostration, what they were saying is when this German ship found them, like the three survivors was like, like laid out. They were exhausted. They were done, but they were alive. They were carried back to Great Britain where they faithfully recounted the details of the shipwreck and of Parker's death to the authorities. They were then charged with murder and tried in Great Britain. But notice what it says. When they got back to port, they told the story. They didn't lie. They could have lied. They could have said Parker died and we ate him. They could have said Parker died and we didn't eat. They could have made up any story they wanted. They were the only three survivors. They could have done anything. But instead, they told the truth. Why? They didn't think they did anything wrong. Does that make sense? That's an important fact. These sailors did not think they did anything wrong. They said, hey, we had to survive. We have families. We have careers. We are the knowledgeable sailors. Our lives are more valuable. Parker had to die. To which point the authorities were like, uh, uh, no, you don't do that. No, no, no. And they arrested them. All right. So when they were arrested, the first time they were put on trial, the jury found that if the men had not fed upon the body of the boy, they probably would not have survived to be picked up and rescued, but would have died because of famine. And that the boy, being in a much weaker condition, was likely to have died before they died. At the time of the act in question, there was no sail in sight, meaning they didn't see any of the ships, nor any reasonable prospect of being saved. And that under the circumstances, there appeared to, the, to them that unless they ate something very quickly, that they would all die of starvation. So they actually were put on trial and a jury said, no, it was OK what they did. But now we have a problem. The problem is that the British authorities still saw there being an issue here. They were afraid that if they let this jury verdict stand, if they let these guys get away with this, that using the defense of necessity, saying it was necessary we killed him so we could survive, that that defense would get out of hand. It would, it would be used far too often to justify an act of murder. So the British courts didn't let it go. They actually put them on trial again. And this, this gets confusing with you know things like appeals and, and the legal steps involved. So I'm just keeping it simple for you guys. Let's just say that the British courts didn't let it go. They had another trial for them. And in this trial, <clears throat> the chief judge showed that he disagreed with the jury in the original trial. He says that they call them the prisoners because technically, you know, I mean, at this point they are arrested, right? So you're talking about Dudley and Stevens might possibly have been picked up the next day by a passing ship. So this judge says, hey, you killed him, but you might have been rescued tomorrow 
or they might not have been rescued at all. In either case, he says, the killing of the boy would have been an unnecessary and profitless act. Think about that. He's saying, hey, you might have been rescued the, day, the next day. Or you might not have been rescued at all. You might have all died. Either way, killing him served no purpose in either of those two situations. So therefore, you had no right to kill him. He goes on to say that there remains to be considered the real question in the case, whether killing under the circumstances set forth in the verdict be or not be murder. The contention that it could be anything else was to the minds of, all, of us all, both new and strange. What the judge is saying is, he's saying the real question here is whether or not the killing of Richard Parker was murder. And his answer is, of course it was murder. For it to be anything else it is crazy to us. This was a, a black and white murder. So the judge in this case, in this new trial, is trying to answer the question if there is any such defense of necessity to murder. Can you truly claim it was necessary we had to kill someone to save ourselves? That's what this judge is trying to figure out. So here's the question. He's restating the question. He's saying this is what we're trying to answer, that in order to save your own life, you may lawfully take away the life of another. When that other is neither attempting nor threatening yours, nor is guilty of any illegal act, whatever towards you or anyone else. Because here's the thing. There is one time that all courts agree that necessity is a defense to murder, to taking someone's life. Self-defense, right? If someone is attacking you, if someone is coming after you and threatens to kill you, or is putting you in a spot where you might be killed or seriously injured, no court is going to say that you in defending yourself, killing that person, have committed murder. But in this case, what was Richard Parker doing? Was he doing anything illegal? Was he threatening the other three sailors? Was he a threat to them? Could he have caused serious bodily injury to them or death? No, he wasn't doing anything. So the judge is saying, this, this doesn't jive to me. And he, he explains self-defense. He says, the necessity which justifies homicide, the killing of a human being, is that only which has always been and is now considered justification. According to the judge, necessity which justifies homicide is of two kinds. One, the necessity which is of a private nature, and two, that <clears throat> necessity which relates to the public justice and safety. The private justification is where that necessity which obligated a man to his own defense and safeguard. So again, remember, this is, this is written – 150 some years ago. So I'm going to make it simple, modern speak for you. He says only two times necessity justifies murder when you're protecting yourself or when it's something like for public justice or safety. So if the police shoot and kill someone and they were justified in doing it, or if someone is sentenced to death and they are executed. So self-defense or when the state is the actor in, in the homicide, in the death is when it is considered, when necessity is a justifiable defense to murder, all right? <clears throat> so here's what the judge continues to say. Now, remember, when judges make a, their opinion, this is called the judge's opinion, which actually is his decision, right? He has to explain to you, or he tries to explain to you why he decided how he decided. So this judge is bringing up all these different examples of why necessity has never been a defense to murder. And one of the things he says is, I take it that here in England, if a person being under necessity for want of clothes or food shall upon that account steal another man's goods, it is a felony and crime by the laws of England and punishable with death. If, therefore, the judge is clear, as he is, that extreme necessity of hunger does not justify stealing, why would then the extreme hunger justify a murder? What the judge is saying is, look, the law here in England is clear. Let's say you were homeless and you were hungry. If you went and stole someone's food to feed yourself, the punishment for that here is death. So the punishment in England at this time, according to this judge, for stealing food is death. You can't argue it was necessary I stole that food because I was hungry and I was going to starve and die. The law says too bad, so sad. Starve and die. You have no right to steal that food. 
So how are these sailors then making the argument that it, they were hungry and it was necessary for them to kill Richard Parker because they were hungry? If you can't justify stealing using necessity, then you can't justify murder using necessity. So the judge is making this point pretty clear. All right. <clears throat> now he goes on to get into even deeper stuff to show why these two sailors – technically three sailors, were wrong in killing Richard Parker. The judge then proceeded to apply the principles of law to the circumstance of this particular case and found that the deliberate killing of Richard Parker was clearly murder, unless the killing can be justified by some well-recognized excuse admitted by law. It is further admitted that there was in this case no such excuse unless the killing was justified by what has been called necessity. So he's saying, we found no excuse that justified the killing of this boy. And necessity in this case, what we know as necessity, self-defense or the government doing something isn't applicable here. This isn't what happened, all right? So what he says is this, he talks about morality. The judge brings in the moral aspect of what they did. He says to preserve one's life is generally speaking a duty. He's saying you have a duty to preserve your own life, but it may be the plainest and highest duty to sacrifice it. So this judge is saying, yes, you have a right and you have a duty to preserve your own life. But we think you have more of a duty possibly to sacrifice yourself to save someone else's life. But now be careful. That sounds a lot like I just contradicted everything I said or everything the judge said. We didn't play along, all right? These duties impose on men the moral necessity, not of the preservation, but of the sacrifice of their lives for others, from which in no country men will ever shirk. It is not correct, therefore, to say that there was an absolute and unqualified necessity to preserve one's life. Let me make that make sense. What he is saying here is, think about the military, think about police, think about firemen. They are willing to sacrifice themselves to save other people. That is okay. If Richard Parker would have gotten up and said, I'm willing to die to save you three men, and then they killed him, the court would have said, that's okay. But that's not what happened. What happened is the three sailors said, he has to die to save us. That's the difference. This judge is talking about what soldiers do. They choose to go fight and sacrifice themselves to save their country, to save their families, to save their fellow countrymen. No one is forcing them to die for that sacrifice for the other people to live. No one is forcing a fireman to go into a burning building and, and risk sacrificing his life to save other people. No one is forcing a police officer to risk sacrificing their life to save other people. The court even looks to religion and talks about what is perhaps the greatest sacrifice of all. For example, if you're a Christian, Jesus sacrificed himself to save people. He gave himself up in order to save people. The difference in this case is people chose to sacrifice someone to save them. And that is the problem. So that's what this whole argument is about. The court says that it is okay if someone chooses to take that high road, that higher duty, and offer to sacrifice themselves to save other people. It is not okay to say it was necessary that he died to save us, therefore we killed him. So look how these facts could have changed. If Richard Parker volunteered, they wouldn't have said this is murder, but he didn't. They said he had to die to, to save us, all right? So the outcome of this case was that Tom Dudley and Edward Stevens are both found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. However, the sentence was later commuted to six months in prison without hard labor. So kind of a twist of fate here. 
the courts didn't really want to punish these two, these two men. They knew how difficult it was for them. In fact, one of the judges even says, I can't imagine what this was like for you guys. And in that situation, I might have done the same thing. But remember I told you about setting up precedent. When a court makes a decision, other courts are then bound. And again, this isn't this is as easy as I can make it. Other courts are then bound to follow that precedent. The British courts wanted to lay down the law, that necessity saying he had to be sacrificed to save us is never a defense for murder. They just wanted that law on the books. They wanted that written down forever to be accepted. They didn't really want Dudley and Stevens to be punished. So even though they were sentenced to death, their sentence was commuted. So that way they used the case to set the law and let these guys go, which whether you agree with it or not at the time seemed fair. All right. So the most important standpoint in this verdict, meaning the decision of the court, is its rejection of the concept of self-preservation as a defense to murder on the ground that such a rule would violate the principle that no person's life is worth more than another's. And it is the proposition of the duty of self-sacrifice instead. So, again, I'm repeating myself a lot and the court's repeating itself a lot. But the idea here being is that. It is not okay to say I needed to kill someone to save me, but it is okay if someone sacrifices themselves to save other people. That would not be murder. But choosing to sacrifice someone who doesn't agree or doesn't want to be involved, that is murder. All right. Let's see. Where did I want to go next? And again, I'm trying to pick out all the points that you guys who are doing this online have to know and have to see. Um Let's see, let's see. You know why they did it. Cutting out some of the fluff for you guys. All right, so now I want you to think about some examples. So, well, let, let's just state this clearly. Every case we're gonna study comes up with a rule of law, meaning that you're gonna learn in civics class the three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. And you're going to be told that only the legislative branch makes law. And that is technically true. However, when a court makes a decision because of this idea of precedent, that other courts will then be bound by that decision, courts, the judicial branch actually also makes law. It wasn't intended to work that way, but it's just the way it works out. When a court makes a decision, that decision then becomes law. So in every case, you're going to be looking for what I call the rule of law. And again, this is what you're going to do in law school if you took this class because you're interested in being an attorney. Or even if you want to be a, a police officer, a corrections officer, you've got to know what the law is based on that case. So here's the rule of law from this case. It is that to save one's own life, one cannot willingly take someone else's innocent life. That's it. That's pretty much it. To save your life, you can't kill an innocent person to do it. You can only kill an, a person if they're technically not innocent, if they're attacking you, if it's in self-defense. So you cannot say it was necessary. I had to kill this person in order for me to survive. That's the rule of law. All right. But now I want to pose some thoughts to you. And I'm actually going to give an assignment for this. There's going to be two assignments. For this. One is going to be online and one is going to be in class. And if you're a C student, an online student, you don't have to worry about, um, Actually, forgive me, that's wrong. You're going to do both of them, just obviously at home. And I'm going to go over both of them with you on this video in a second, and I'm going to put it up in the, uh, the class assignment one. We're going to have two days to do this because it's a lot of work because you're going to have to actually, excuse me, go look up Regina versus Dudley Stevens. I'll show you how. There's tons of websites to do it, and you're going to have to make your case brief, and then you're going to answer these two questions, which I'll have written down for you. So don't worry about like backing up the video and trying to figure it out. The first is think about this. <clears throat> so necessity can never be a defense to murder. What about if there were conjoined twins? Well, like, like Siamese twins, when, when there are two babies that are born conjoined, stuck together, for lack of a better word. Um, the parents and the physician, the doctor, here's my hypothetical to you, understand that allowing them to remain joined would cause both of them to die, okay? 
So if the doctor and the parents say, no, we want our kids not separated, they're both going to die. But if they do perform the operation, child B would be killed and child A would probably live. This actually happened, by the way. If the operation was not performed, they'd both die. So how do you feel about that? Necessity, sacrificing an innocent life is not a justification to save another one, but save your own. So how do you deal with the issue of conjoined twins? Well, the courts, I want you to think about that. I want you to answer that. I want you to answer in your own way. How is that different than Dudley and Stevens? Because the court did say it's different. Right. By the way, there's no wrong answer here. I'm just curious as to what your thought process is. If necessity is never a justification for murder, how does this doctor, how does the physician and the parents get away with saying, yes, do this operation, even though we know one will die to save the other? OK, how about this? It appears that we all agree that if you think about something like 9-11, let's say that there was another attack like 9-11 about to happen. And the authorities got word that there was a plane full of innocent passengers flying towards a building. I think almost everyone agrees it would be okay to shoot that plane down, but thereby killing all the innocent people on board. Aren't we then sacrificing people who may not agree to be sacrificed in order to save other people? Isn't that by what we talked about that necessity is never a justification for murder? in order to save someone else's life, unless the person volunteers to be sacrificed, gives up their own life, or if they're doing something that might harm you or hurt you, but the passengers aren't doing something that might harm you or hurt you. So I want you to think about that. It's an interesting question too. How about this? I'm actually gonna give you, this is gonna be one of your test questions that I'm gonna write down. Let's say that I, in class, put a gun to your head and I say, I'm going to kill you unless you kill the person sitting next to you. Can you do it? Can you kill that innocent person sitting next to you? And then say it was necessary I killed them in order to save my own life. According to what we just learned, what do you think? But now take it one step further. What if I put a gun to your head and I say, kill that person next to you or I kill you? And the student next to you says, do it. I'm okay with it. I am willing to sacrifice myself so you can survive. Can you do it then? Based on Dudley versus, sorry, based on Regina versus Dudley and Stevens, what's the answer to that question? And then prove it to me by using the facts from this case. All right? So that's it. But now what I'm going to have you do is in class, and if you're at home, you are going to do for me what's called a case brief. OK, and I have all this good stuff pulled up for you. So here's my web page. If you go to my web page and you click on assignments, it's going to take you here and it's going to say case brief format. Case briefs are going to be six pages long. OK, no more than that, because you shouldn't put all this in from you shouldn't put too much information on it. Page one just has the name and the date of the case. This is Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. All right. I'll show you how you can find anything online if you're not in class. OK. Now, all pages must also include an illustration you create that is relevant to that part of the case brief. So pretty much what you're doing for me is you're making a book. And again, if you were in class, you already heard my explanation for why we illustrate stuff and how important it is. This is going to help you remember things. So the name and date of the case, and then on your front cover page, some illustration about this case. So maybe a ship. Maybe someone last year drew like a like like a ham bone, or like a leg of lamb or something and laugh. I laugh because they knew this case was about you know, someone getting eaten. So the reason I make you draw a picture is to help you remember this case. OK, so that's page one. So at the top, you just put the name and date of the case and you draw me an illustration about it and put your name at the bottom. Page two is the parties involved in the case. So you need to tell me all the people who were involved and important in this case. So who do we have? We have Dudley, the captain. We have Stevens, the mate. We have Brooks, a sailor. And we have Richard Parker, the, uh, the cabin boy. So that's where you're going to list the parties. You don't have to list Regina, the queen. She's not a, a party to this case. 
right? Just the people who were important and involved. So again, on the page, you're going to write all the people involved. Then give me an illustration of each. Why? It'll help you remember who they are. So um, Dudley, the captain, some lasher drew a guy with like a captain's hat on, right? Um, the mate, the cabin boy, right? Richard Parker was a sickly 16-year-old cabin boy. Something that helps you, an illustration that helps you remember the role that all these people play. Page three is the facts. You are going to write, I'll show you an example of a case brief in a second without the pictures, but I'll show you an example. You're going to write the relevant facts in this case. Like for example, do you think the name of the boat is important? No. Do you think that them getting off course, them getting lost at sea without any food, without any water, do you think that are all important facts? Yes. Do you think it's an important fact that they didn't ask Richard Parker if he wanted to die? Yes. Do you think it's an important fact that they freaking jug him in the throat with a pen knife and kill him? Yes. That's an important fact. So your fact shouldn't be more than like half a written page, only the important facts of the case. All right. Now, page four is the issue. Page four, what question is the court trying to answer? Right. What is the, the issue that the court is trying to figure out? The issue here is, is necessity ever a defense to murder? I gave it to you. Is necessity ever a defense to murder? Or you could say, is it OK for someone to kill an innocent person in order to save their own life? That's the issue the, court, the, the court's trying to answer. Pretty much what a case brief is in my class. You're making one thing per page and drawing a picture. So let's say um, my daughter's a freshman. She's y'all's age, but she's not taking my class. Let's say she says, hey, dad, what you, what'd you teach about in class today? And I give her one of your case briefs. I'm like, check it out, that she could read it at y'all's level, ninth graders, and by looking at all six pages, understand what this case is talking about, what this case is all about. That's the point of a case brief. All right, so you're making a book to explain to someone what this case is about. So page four is the issue. What questions is the court trying to answer? Page five is what you call the holding and reasoning. Meaning the holding is, how did they answer the question? Is necessity ever a defense to murder? How did they answer that question? No, except in issues of self-defense, where the person isn't innocent. They're actually trying to hurt you or do something wrong. And why? The reasoning is why. So the holding is, did the court say yes or no to the issue? And why? The reasoning is the most important part. Guys, feel free to write as much as you want here on your page. But what you're doing is you're explaining to me why the judge in this court said, no, necessity is not a justification for murder. And I gave you the examples, right, from the reading. And if you're, if you're a C student, you can find all this online. I'll show you where. But the reasoning was, remember, that it's only okay if someone is trying to hurt or attack you. And on a moral level, we've never acknowledged that it's okay to kill someone to save yourself, an innocent person to save yourself. What did they say the moral issue was? It is okay if someone volunteers to sacrifice themselves in order to save you, right? We talked about police and military and firemen. And then even the judge invoked Christianity and said Jesus sacrificed himself to save humanity. Never did anyone say, I have to kill him to save me. It's always been, I offer my life to save these people, right? That's the reasoning. Why did the court decide that? And then page six, the last page is the rule of law. What law do we take away from this case? What, what law did this case establish, right? What law did this case come up with that now always has to be followed? And that is that it is never okay to sacrifice an innocent person against their will in order to save your own life. Or simply enough, necessity is never a justification for murder unless it is something in self-defense, okay? So what I did was I just pulled up Regina versus Dudley and Stevens on the internet, and you'll find tons of stuff. Here's an example of a case brief without pictures that you guys can see, right? So where they say citation, that's the name of the case, Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. Facts, you're going to write more facts than this. Or you're actually going to write out some facts, what this is. There you go. Facts, right? What are the important facts here? The issue, 
What is the question the court's trying to answer? Whether the killing of Parker was murder considering the circumstances of the case. What is the holding and reasoning? Yes, it's murder. And again, why? All right. Here's an example of one that I did from law school. So I had to change it a little bit because this was for a, a criminal law case. But the parties who was involved in this case, the facts, a brief synopsis of the facts, the issue, what question is the court trying to answer? Here I put the rule of law first, but here's the rule, the holding, answer the question, and the reasoning, why? Then the rule of law would really come cut at the end. Based. But that's how it works. So parties, facts, issue, holding, and reasoning, I put these on the same page for you guys, and rule of law. You can always find them right here. And that's it. And then for each page, you have to draw a picture of something relevant to that issue, so uh, to that part. So pick one of the facts, draw a picture, like the open dinghy, okay? The issue, draw something about the issue, the holding and reasoning, draw something about why. Someone last year drew you know, a, a cross invoking the idea that Jesus sacrificed, self-sacrifice, military, stuff like that, or something about the case itself, and then the rule of law. Something that will help you, you draw something that will always help you remember what the rule of law for this case was. And that's it. So again, guys, I know this was a really long lecture, but you have to remember that when we're in class, it's 120 minutes, an hour, just about an hour and a half, right, of time that we have to do. And we're going to do a lot of these readings. And again, if you're a C student, I will put all this up for you and show you how to find the information. I just have to get this paperwork put onto my Google Classroom. But for those of you who will be in class, you'll see it today, uh, tomorrow, and you'll see it on Tuesday when we have two days to do it. But that's pretty much it. That's what we're going to do this week is Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. So <clears throat> I gave you the facts on this lecture. You can just look up Regina versus Dudley and Stevens. I'll put something in the description of this video for you to look up. You can find the facts. You can find the issue. You can find the reasoning and make yourself a case brief book that's six pages long, at least six pages. If you want to write more on some page, you can, but don't go out of hand. Remember, it's brief. You're just trying to give someone a synopsis of the case. So page one, name and date of the case. Page two, the party is involved. Page three, the facts. Page four, the issue. Page five, the reason holding. And page six, the rule of law. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed this. It is a good case to talk about. And it will come up again a bunch as we keep going through the year. Because as you keep getting tested, I'm going to keep asking you or put you in situations where I say, is necessity ever an excuse for murder? And the answer is going to be no. All right. So um, I will see you in class. I will see you this week and we will keep getting it done. But hopefully you enjoyed our first case about cannibalism because I think it's great. All right. Until next time.